Hi there, I'm Jen. This is Remembered Reads, and this is going to be a wrap up of my Booktube Prize reading for the nonfiction final. I had not read any of the six books that made it to the final before it was announced, and only one of the books that was, was on this list was even something I was looking to read, so this has been interesting. It is a much more US focused bunch of books than I think I would normally read in a row. <laughs> So, um, so that was interesting. So the first of the books that I read, because it was the first one that came in at the library, was Daniel James Brown's Facing the Mountains, a true story of Japanese American heroes in World War II. This is a book that is mostly following a group of men who were in a single unit that fought in the European theater for the United States in the Second World War, but it also talks about one of their contemporaries who was a conscientious objector. As a collection of information and stories that often are ignored, this is very worthwhile. However, as a book, I didn't think this worked particularly well because I didn't have a sense that the author really knew if he was writing a social history or a military history, so there are bits of both, which is a bit unsatisfying. And I've seen a number of people who don't like military history commenting on the fact that the chunk that is combat stories was not that interesting to them. And on the flip side, I think a lot of people who enjoy military history did not need to hear all of the really in-depth backgrounds about these people's lives before the war. The other issue is that I was never quite sure if the author thought maybe what he was doing was writing a portrait of a generation, and that's why we also have the guy who is the conscientious objector. But the problem with that is that if, if that was his goal, then he also needed to talk about, there was a unit that a couple of the men in this pretended they didn't speak very good Japanese because they didn't want to end up in this unit that was going to be sent to the Pacific Theater to do spy work, for example. So if this had been a portrait of a generation, we would have needed to hear more about them. We also would have needed to hear more about the women who were either in the internment camps or, or who were running businesses in Hawaii. And we just don't hear those stories, really. It, they might be touched on once or twice. So I didn't feel like this book knew what it was. But at the same time, I think it's information that will be useful for people who are Second World War buffs or who are big into Japanese American history or Asian American history in general. But again, I think that is because of the material itself and not because of the book as a product on its own. Obviously, it's what's carrying the material forward, but it's not particularly good. If you were reading this and you didn't care about the information itself, I don't think it works at all. Um, if you do care, it's worthwhile just for the information and not for the format in which it's being told or conveyed, however you want to phrase that. And as someone who normally enjoys a good war story, I was expecting that to be easier to get through, and instead it was incredibly tedious. And that is purely because of the style that it's written in. I was disappointed with that one, uh, especially because I didn't think that was as good as some of the books I read back in the first round that didn't even make it out of the first round. So, but what are you going to do there? Next up, a piece of nature slash pop science writing. This is Elizabeth Colbert's Under a White Sky, The Nature of the Future. This is a very short book in which the author visits a number of sites, mostly where environmental damage had been done because past generations of people, or just people recently, tried to fix one problem by causing another problem. So it talks about things like the Asian carp, in North America, invasive species, things about the coral reef in Australia, things about trying to turn carbon emissions into stone, things like that. And all of these are interesting on their own. I could imagine any chapter in here would work as an article in Discover Magazine where you would nod along and say, yes, that's very interesting. As a book, it wasn't super cohesive and it didn't feel finished. There are a couple of points at the end where the author comments that there was one person that she had wanted to talk to again, but they died before she could talk to them. There's another point where she was supposed to be visiting a site a second time and she couldn't do it because it was 2020 and everybody was in lockdown and you couldn't travel. So it felt like this book should have had more to it, but just because of the flukes of the pandemic and this one person dying, she couldn't actually finish the book and what we get feels incomplete. So what is here, I really liked, but it just doesn't feel like a full book. It feels like a collection of somebody's articles from something like Discover Magazine. So I liked this a lot. This was a book that was quick to get through, but yeah, it just doesn't feel like a, a complete product. It feels like it needed an additional three or four chapters and they're just not there. 
And I don't think you normally feel that way. Sometimes you think, oh, that was too short. I could have read lots more, but that genuinely felt like it was missing something that was meant to be there. And because of all of that, I don't feel like I have a lot to say about it because again, it was interesting in the way that a lot of pop science is interesting when it's talking about something that you're not super familiar with. And in all of those cases, it was things I wasn't familiar with. So I felt, had that feeling of, oh, this is educational. I could read more about this thing. But again, it felt incomplete. Next up, I read Empire of Pain, The Secret History of the Sackler Dynasty by Patrick Redden Keefe. A lot of people really love this book, so maybe this was overhyped to me. This is about the Sackler family and the three brothers of the original generation who got involved in the business side of pharmacy and were medical doctors who all were working at what was then an insane asylum, I suppose, and were working for chemical solutions for mental illnesses originally, and then the two younger brothers eventually really unethical marketing plan for OxyContin that created an opioid epidemic in the US, basically. So this was really interesting, especially the early stuff where they're talking about the brothers doing experiments and trying to figure out like what does electroconvulsive therapy do and how could you replicate that with drugs? And then, oh, well, Thorazine has a limited market. Imagine if we could sell Valium to millions of people and then how that changes over time. So all of that was really interesting. All of the bits about marketing and the business secrecy and what you could get away with as a private, privately owned business versus a publicly traded business and all of that really interesting uh, and how things pass down to the next generation. I was less interested in what then became character portraits of some of the family members later in this book, because as he goes along, we're talking less about people inventing things, whether it's drugs or whether it's marketing plans. And he's just talking about people who inherited a lot of money. And the author seems to be poking us to go, don't you hate this family? And that's worthwhile when you're talking about people that have this marketing plan that is selling drugs to doctors so that they prescribe it to people who don't need it and etc. That's appalling. But when he's pointing out like the grandchildren who are in other businesses, but are obviously benefiting from this, or oh, there's one person who's an in-law who's a fashion designer and he wants us to hate them. And they're very hateable in that kind of rich people who don't understand their privilege kind of way and everybody hates the ultra rich. However, that kind of distracts from the main point of the book. I thought that was really lazy. Telling me, don't you hate this rich person is not the same as saying, look at this appalling moral failure of this business and what actual damage it did to people. That is a compelling story on its own. I don't need to be told, hey, don't you hate this fashion designer? She's rich, she's obnoxious. I, I don't care about the fashion designer who happened to marry into this family. And yes, she's rich and obnoxious and I kind of hate her for that. But that is, I felt like that cheapened this book. And there are a couple of bits like that where I just thought, this is lazy. That doesn't need to be in here. I would take this a lot more seriously if it wasn't including things like that. Uh, similarly, a couple of times the author gets really dramatic and he's like, in Greek mythology, as with Pandora letting things out of the box of Prometheus giving people fire, like, come on, we do not need that kind of nonsense. So, I mean, as I said, a lot of people loved this. Like people told me when I posted on Instagram that I was reading this, oh, it's excellent. And I read this and thought this is not excellent because it engages in this lazy, don't you hate these people over the top, to, like, let me compare this to Greek mythology and I did not need this. Like the research that went into this is fantastic and the work that was, that the investigative elements of this that the author put into are admirable, but I did not need all this extra stuff. And it is a shame to cheapen what is the investigative element, great. The narrative element of this, mostly great. But I found it really infuriating that he was essentially cheapening his own work by adding these lazy things of, don't you hate these rich people? Like, yes, but I don't need that in this story. You know, I can just hate the people who create it, this horrible situation. I don't need to hate their daughters and daughters-in-law. <laughs> you know, that, that was lazy. Next up is Clint Smith's How the Word is Passed, A Reckoning of the History of Slavery in America. This is a really interesting book that I thought was really compellingly written. It is basically a travelogue that 
simultaneously deals with the myth making around US history. So he goes to various sites that are some that are connected to the US history of slavery and goes on actual tours there or takes part in events that are happening, commemorations, things like that. And then talks to a few people who are there and gets their opinions in addition to the official story and whatnot. So it's a really fantastic way to kind of merge travel writing and history. And it's, as I said, and it's written in such a compelling style. So this was a really fantastic read, but at the same time, occasionally frustrating because a number of the places that he visits, I have either been to or have been to similar places. So for example, he goes to Monticello, Jefferson's house, and he goes on the slavery tour. And I have also been on the slavery tour at Monticello. And so that was interesting hearing him. It might have even been the same guy doing the tour. So that was interesting. But he talks about like the demographics of the people on the tour and the reactions of some of the people that he shared on the tour and the questions that they asked. And this was where we get to the issue that I had with this, which is that he is basically taking his experience of the demographics of the people on the tour and the questions that they asked and then their feedback as being representative of the average one. And I wasn't convinced that that was always true, like especially the group that he does the tour with, for example, are all shocked at all of the rapes that were happening between Jefferson and Sally Hemings and then also Jefferson's father-in-law, who was probably the father of both Sally Hemings and his wife. and things like that. And the assumption that he's making is that people go on this tour and they don't know that any of that happened. And that I don't think is necessarily true. I feel like this is one of these stories that is cyclical and it went into fashion and out. Because for example, the movie Jefferson in Paris, which talk, has the Jefferson Hemings relationship in it, came out in 1995. He talks a little bit about that era too, because he mentions the Oprah special where she had descendants from both Jefferson's wife and from Sally Hemings on the show and things like that. And when I went on the same tour, one of the things that people were asking was whether Jefferson's wife and Sally Hemings considered themselves siblings and how people thought about that then. And the tour guide was yelling at them, no, it was slavery. Don't be romanticizing any of these relationships. And he was talking about letters that Jefferson's wife had sent saying, you know, shame on you to somebody who uh, asked her about her father's relationship with Sally Hemings, his mother and stuff like that, which is a different kind of question than his group was getting. So when he was writing about the assumptions that the people on his tour were going in with, they were not the same as the assumptions and the questions that I heard when I went on this tour. So when he presents this as this is the story that either the world or the US or white US Americans. I wasn't convinced of that just because it seemed like he could have gone on the same tour on a different day like I did and met different people who had a different reaction. So, th so that raised questions and I felt that throughout. There's another part he goes to, for example, the Whitney Plantation, which is a plantation that has more of a focus on the lives of the enslaved people. And then he also goes to a Confederate cemetery. And I haven't been to either of those, but I went to the Laura Plantation, which is a plantation that's also on the Louisiana African American History Tour, along with the Whitney Plantation, which has more of a focus on, again, the enslaved people and on Creole culture. And I also went to the Oak Alley Plantation, which is more of a gone with the wind fantasy, which I think similar to the Confederate Cemetery is that more the uglier side of romanticizing the South kind of thing. And again, I felt like some of the questions were similar, but not always the same. And so when, again, when he's talking about his tour groups, I thought a lot of this is really specific and it's fantastic because it's interesting and I'm nosy and I like knowing what people, what these other people that he went on tours with thought. But I just didn't think that they were as easy to generalize as he was presenting them. So that raised questions to me about how valuable that is as a, as a generalization. So this is sounding more negative than I mean it to be because I do think this is fantastic and like the stuff when he visits Angola prison, which was some, that was the thing that that was horrific. And especially because in that one, he's not so much talking to other people on the tour. He's talking to someone who had been in prison there. And so that's really interesting. And that's a different thing than when he's talking to tour people like the Hidden History New York tour. He's talking to a German tourist and talking about what their understanding was. And again, that's interesting. But I went on a hidden tour of um, Charleston, South Carolina with some friends of mine who are not from North America as well. And again, their reactions I think was different than this German guy. Now, some of that because these were people who are Indo-Kenyan from the UK 
And so their expectations from history are going to be different than an ethnic German from Germany, right? So there is some of that in there. But again, is this German guy representative of foreigners taking these tours? I don't think so. And again, it's interesting to know his opinions. I don't know that it was valuable as a generalization. However, all of that said, I think it's kind of unfair to be judging on that basis because this is incredibly compelling stuff. And I think this is information that a lot of people don't have and that a lot of people have not been on these tours or similar ones. And so all of this is really, it will be incredibly educational. So I don't want to be dismissive of that. So I have kind of reservations about how how much he generalizes from the experiences of, of specific people on the tours. I do think this is incredibly valuable because, I mean, people do buy into a lot of mythology and he is trying to get through that. You could write a specific book on every chapter that's in here. It's just a fluke that I happen to have been on a bunch of similar tours and so have a different set of expectations of what the other people on the tour are going to think, are going to act, and are, how they're going to react. That is just fantastically written though and very compelling. And I think especially if you're not familiar with the history, I think it's super useful that way. Next up, I'll talk about the book that was the one that I was planning to read. And this is Hanif Abdurraqib's A Little Devil in America, Notes in Praise of Black Performance. I'm a huge fan of this author's poetry and I follow him on social media. I enjoy hearing him talk about sports and post pictures of his dog. So I'm kind of biased in favor of this, I guess. And this is an interesting book because it is primarily about music and dance and performance with regards to black American performers performing both for an audience of other black Americans and of an audience of white and or just other non-black US people and then possibly an international audience in the background, but primarily with a US focus. And it's interwoven with bits of other pop culture references and other bits of memoir. So he will talk about his experience of funerals and then talk about music at a different kind of funeral. And he'll talk about his experience of hearing a certain kind of music at a certain point in the 1990s versus how people would have heard it at a different point in time in a just really fantastically compelling way. But again, I'm biased. I enjoy his writing to begin with. And it was fun. Some of the references that he makes in his poetry to the movie The Prestige are also in here. And I thought that was brilliant. And it is the kind of book too, where as he's talking about the history of certain songs or the recordings of them, you do want to pause and go listen to the song, which I think is great fun as kind of a multimedia experience if you're able to do that as you're reading it. So that was grand. This is my favorite of the books in this group, but as I said, I really enjoy this author's writing in general. So to a certain extent, it wouldn't have even mattered what the subject matter was. I just enjoy the, the way he talks about general pop culture and also life. So I think the issue with this is that not everyone is interested in the kind of poetic aspect that he has going on here. And also not everybody wants the memoir elements in with their music history. But for me, this absolutely worked. and. As I said, this is the one book I was planning to read before I was given this group, so. And finally, the last book that I read was Chasing Me to My Grave, an artist's memoir of the Jim Crow South by Winfred Rembert, as told to Aaron Kelly. This book is a memoir in a very clear mimicking of storytelling style. So Rembert was telling Kelly his story and she wrote it down, it seems, just about as it was told. Uh, in the notes, she comments that she read it by him in the end so that he would correct anything that he didn't like. But it does feel like if you're sitting on a park bench and somebody sits next to you and they start telling you about their life or you're talking to somebody's uncle, somebody's grandfather, this is what this feels like. And I thought it was fantastically compelling that way. And also there are a couple of bits where the story is being told by the author's wife. And I thought that was fantastic too because in any memoir you know that there is a certain amount of fiction to it. And I think, feel like this is the flip side of when I was talking in the translated group about people who downvote books because they're autofiction and say this isn't really fiction. But I think you get the flip side in something like this where people reinvent themselves all the time and as you replay your memory, you kind of edit the memories. And so having that draws attention to the fact that these are not, and this is in terms of the later memories because that was after the point when he had met and married his wife, but it points out that there could be another story here, but what you're getting is the essence or the feeling of the truth. 
And I thought that was brilliant. This is also fully illustrated with the author's work. His art style was um, paint on leather and leather etching. So we don't get the full three-dimensional element of it, but it is really clear, good quality photos and just really fantastic. I think it works as a coffee table book as well as it works as a memoir. Now, unfortunately, I think some people who didn't like this don't like it for the coffee table book element. And I saw a couple of people say, why would you put a coffee table book in amongst these other things? But uh, I've made videos before in defense of coffee table books. So I thought the, the quality of the photos made this fantastic as a coffee table book, in addition to being fantastic as a kind of oral history slash storytelling style memoir. So for those particular genres, I thought this was exceptional because I think it's really difficult, uh, one, to have the page quality to reproduce the photos, but also to be able to poke at the subjective nature of memory in a way that doesn't feel condescending because that's hard to do, but by having those bits by the wife, it works. And I thought that was such a brilliant choice. I was so impressed with the way this was handled. And I think this is about as good as you can get when it comes to combining those style of genres. This was just really well done. And also, because I read this after having read this one, and I felt like there are certain stories in here when the author is a child and he's talking about being on a cotton plantation with his mother. And it's the 1950s, but it feels like it could be the 1850s. And in a lot of ways, I feel like this does a certain amount of what some of the chapters in this one were doing, especially in the prison chapter, for example, where by having it be one man's story and not trying to generalize, it works as a generalization almost better than generalizing, but then making the reader asks questions about how much can you generalize this? Whereas this by being one man's story of being a child and his mother being this kind of tenant farmer and then of being an adult who was sent to prison and then working on a chain gang, which is the kind of modern slavery and thinking about that kind of thing. I think it almost works as something that you generalize yourself as the reader rather than having to have a writer uh, filter it through their own perspective and make you generalize it and encourage you to generalize it because I think you just do it naturally when you hear this kind of story. So yeah, I thought this worked on so many levels on a storytelling basis, on a kind of portrait of those times in the US South and as an artist process and as a memoir of an individual and as a coffee table book. So yeah, this was just top notch, I think in every way that it can be. And I think the idea that you can't compare a personal story like this to say a portrait of a dynasty as it's supposed to be here. I absolutely think you can because I feel like this because of the bits where where the author is pointing out things that were irrelevant for the main story makes this weaker for what it is versus something like this that I think succeeded on the level of what it was attempting to do. As I'm filming this, I have not submitted my rankings yet. So I'm going to try to talk it through here. And then when I'm done, I'm going to rank them because here's my dilemma. I think this succeeded on every level for what it was trying to do. Now, I know some people are dismissive of one memoir and two coffee table books. So this may be an unpopular opinion, but I think this was the best one because it succeeded in every way that it could. And on the flip side, I'm going to say that this has to be last uh, facing the mountain because the information is great but the format is not, and it wasn't compellingly written. And I'm someone who likes war stories. So if I want to hear people's war stories and I still didn't like this, I would call that a failure. As I said, I'm biased, but I'm gonna put A Little Devil in America in the second slot because I do think this was successful at everything it was trying to do, but I don't think it is maybe as widely accessible just because I know some people do not want they want to read about musicians. They don't want to read about the author's life. And that's in there too. This was my favorite. So I think for third, I'm going to say how the word is passed. I almost feel like I should pop it into second, but I don't think I'm wrong to have been questioning some of the, the generalizations that are being made about what people know about history, but maybe I'm giving people too much credit when I say that. So I don't know, but I feel like it has to go in third just because in basically 70% of the time in this book, I was saying, I would say to myself, I don't think that's as general as he's making it out to be, even though I think this is important. And I think 
people in the US should be reading this. But I had, ah, I feel, <laughs> I feel conflicted about the fact that I didn't think some of the interviews that he, he had with other people on tours were as easy to generalize, as he said, because that is such a minor thing in the general story of here is the history and here is the myth making and here is the new myth making, which is interesting that happens at the end. But I feel like if the book opens itself to somebody saying, I don't think that's how everyone perceives history. This, your group was not representative of every group. But again, it's very good. So I feel conflicted about having that criticism, but I have that criticism. So what are you gonna do? I have a dilemma about these because I liked this a lot, but it really feels incomplete. Whereas I was irritated with this, but it's, it does a lot. So I don't know. And I don't know which should be weighted heavier. I think I'll go with my gut and say Under a White Sky was more readable and less frustrating, aside from the fact that it feels incomplete. Whereas Empire of Pain was frustrating. So I guess this is number five. All right, that was easier than I thought it was going to be. If you were also judging this group, I'd love to hear what you thought. I know a lot of people have said, already said that this is their favorite book of the year. So I think this is probably an unpopular opinion. I am now going to spend a bunch of time reading things by people who are not US Americans because that's a lot of uh, US writers for me to read in a row. And if you were reading in the translated fiction, I'd love to hear how you ranked those. Anyway, this has been great fun. So thank you to Robert from Barter Hordes for creating this. This has been, yeah, as I said, great fun. And I would not have read most of these books had it not been, been for this event. So cheers for that. All right, that's it for now. Ciao.